Welcome to Ethereal Mechanics, video number 18. This is the second video in the electromagnetism series. Uh, we skipped the first one, which was just an experiment on, on Faraday's law. And here we're going to discuss new electromagnetism uh, up to version 4. Uh, as you re may recall from previous videos, uh, version 5 is what's going to be released in Ethereal Mechanics. So. Uh, the reason, uh, so in this we're going to introduce the new electromagnetism V3 and V4 up to that. Uh, we're going to explain the reasoning which led to the search for the new model of induction and the reasoning behind the new model for magnetism and then we're going to do a little looking forward into uh, version 5 models. Oh, by the way, this is for electrical engineers. Uh, I don't think people that are uh, not familiar with electromagnetic theory may, may have a difficult time uh, following this, but uh, the original goal for new electromagnetism was to write all of the models of electromagnetism uh, into a second order effects. In other words, we're going to have a charge to charge effects that include both position, velocity, and acceleration. This would be the zero order, the first order, and the second order term. Okay. So that was the goal, because if charges are the most fundamental building blocks of electromagnetic theory, then electromagnetism must be reduced to charge-to-charge -charge effects uh, in three, three, uh, second-order effects. So the original attempt, I took the classical models and tried to fit them into that role. Okay, Coulomb's law already is in. Coulomb would be the zero order zero order and it's already in that form a charge to charge zero order effect we can take f equals qv cross b combine that with the biot savart law and we get we, we end up with this so it looks like we have a magnetic model but then for acceleration acceleration would be charge changing current which would be faraday's law um, faraday's law cannot be put into this form and that struck me as odd but more than that um, there's a lot of other problems, Faraday. If you go and you look on video number 11, I'll show you that Faraday's law is ambiguous. You can't tell what it's going to do to an independent charge. And in video 3, uh, Faraday's law cannot explain the inductance of a dipole antenna, which is a serious problem because a dipole needs to have inductance to radiate, to be resonant as well. Um, so, but there's also a problem with reciprocity. Okay, I can take Faraday's law and the Biot-Savart law and take uh, time uh, accelerating charges and I can calculate how that's going to affect the charges in a closed loop of wire. But I can't take those same models and take a time changing current in a loop of wire and understand how it's going to affect uh, char external charges. It, the model breaks down, it doesn't work that way. In my world, reciprocity works fine in electromagnetism. So if the models can't do a reciprocal function, then the models are incomplete. Okay, so what do we have right now? Faraday's law can explain mutual inductance, which is if you have a time-changing current in one loop, you can compute the EMF induced in a second loop. So it's a, a linkage from one loop to another. Faraday's law works wonderfully for that. There's no problem at all. It gets very accurate results, a result you can take to the bank. The problem is, is when you want to calculate the self-inductance of a loop, that's when the magnetic field links back to the same loop. Okay, we find out from classical theory that it's not only Fair oh, this is Faraday's law, by the way. It's not only Faraday's law, but you have to add in this extra term here, this intrinsic, or some people call it internal inductance model. Okay, and so wait, I'm like thinking, well, gee, I mean, Faraday's law is not the cat's meow when it comes to inductance. There's this other thing, and this other thing isn't explained by a classical force model. This other thing is backwards derived from uh, conservation of energy techniques. And if you've watched my previous video, I detest models that are derived from conservation or, or energy techniques. And this turns out to be inc incorrect. You can go to my graduate thesis here and I show you a very simple experiment to show you that this is completely bogus and it's amazing to me that nobody has ever run the ex simple experiment to verify if this is nonsense or not. And this is complete nonsense. Okay, so, but now we're left with the fact that we don't have a complete model for 
the inductance, self-inductance of a loop, because Faraday's law obviously needs something else. So I said, okay, I can figure out what a model for inductance should be. Okay, so I need an experiment, a self-inductance experiment, that keeps intrinsic inductance constant because we don't know what it is. And that experiment is a rhombus-shaped loop because the length of the rhombus stays the same, but I can change the area without changing the outside length of the wire. So this turns out to be the perfect experiment to identify what the induction model should be and keeping the intrinsic inductance constant so that we can identify what the correct induction model is. Okay, and basically the experiment that was done, uh, besides there was a lot of experiments before I came around to the, the, the knowledge that the intrinsic inductance was, was wrong. I, I, I believed it when I first started out and it took me a while to realize that that was bogus. And a simple, if I had just done a simple experiment, I could have identified it early on that the intrinsic inductance was bogus. Anyway, these experiments were conducted with an 18, uh, 18 inches on a side. DIM-1 is 18 inches with 22 gauge wire. Okay, and dimension 2 can be changed. Okay, these are the experimental results. These were done in 1997. Uh, H is the code for the simulation routine for a rhombus. 18 is dimension 1, that's dimension 2, the, the, zero, the third dimension is not used in this simulation. And this is the measured uh, inductance in nanohenries. Okay, uh, back in 2007 I built a completely new one uh, using a, a much more rigid uh, wood rhombus. Uh, those are the measurements taken at that time. These were taken with a current ramp induction metering technique. These were taken with an Agilent LCR meter. So this could, because of the different construction and other things, they're going to be off hopefully just by a constant. But both data will give you the same results when you run it through the software, the search software. So how do we parameterize the experiment? Well, given the rhombus, uh, and, and because inductance is going to be a double line integral or path integral, some people say, where uh, we divide up the rhombus into fragments, I'm going to call them fragments, differential lengths or delta lengths or whatever you want to call them, and these red indicate any given two fragments in the loop. At any given time, one is going to be the source, which is going to emit energy and be received by a target. Okay, so that is the key. That's the geometry we have to figure out. How does a source fragment interact with a target fragment? Uh, granted, we're going to have to do this over a double line integral to get the full effects, but this is the basic geometry we're looking for. So what we have here is each fragment, this is the source fragment, this is the target fragment. Now, these don't look like those, I just drew these out here. It has a differential length, which is just a magnitude, or delta length some people would use. The target has a differential length. The source has a source angle. This is an angle from north. Okay, the target has a target angle. Again, this is an angle from north. It really should be a direction. Using the word angle is kind of misleading there. It should really be direction. And then you have the radius between, the radial distance between the source and the target that has a magnitude and, an, and a direction. Okay, those are all the, 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 the geometry of the differential lengths of the rhombus. Okay, so how do we come up with how this fragment interacts with this fragment? Well, I came up with a computer program. Sorry for the mess. I, I wrote something on the back because the last minute thing and it kind of bled through. But the computer search has four columns in it. It has a prefix, uh, A, B, and C, which I, in the computer software I call this F1, F2, and F3, function 1, 2, and 3. Okay, and what the computer is going to do, it's going to go through each one of these prefixes and permutate that with each one of these A geometries. This actually goes down to uh, 22 in the newer software, it goes down to 27 geometries in the old software. And columns B and C are identical to A. And the reason why I did that is because if you select geometry, uh, you can have sine cubed, you know, if it goes across, you get sine cubed of the source angle minus the, the radial angle. Okay, and you can see that, that these geometries are basically the angle relationships between the two fragments. These are the distance relationships in magnitude only. These aren't vector. These are just uh, scalar distances. And you can see in the prefix we start with the distance has no effect. 
it's distance as a, you know, a multiplier effect, distance squared is a multiplier, and then we have an inverse cube, inverse square, and an inverse law. So we, when we permutate these geometries, we select each one of these prefixes, and then we select each one from each column, and we permutate everything. The total permutations on the original software were 45,000 different permutations. Okay, so for example, um, let me give you an example of geometry 5, 0, 0, 8 comes up. That would be 0, uh, 5, which is 1 over D, times 0, 0, which is 1 times 1, times 8, which is the cosine of the target angle minus the source angle. Okay, that's how you read the table. Okay, so all the geometries come out as a four number code and that tells how they were permutated through the table. Now here's the nonsense on the back. There's, there's a simplification to reduce the optimization and this is the solution for opti the optimization. Uh, basically, you, for each prefix and for each F1 column, F2 will never start below F1 and F3 will never start below F2. Um, these 22's are how many elements you have in the geometry columns. Uh, you can read the rest of that on your own. I'm not going to go through that. So what was the results of the software? The software, which ran over the weekend um, in 1997, because uh, it was running on a 386 without a math coprocessor, took the whole weekend to go through the 45,000 different geometries. It came up with two, two geometries that fit the data so well I couldn't tell which one was better or worse. Um, and the two geometries were 5008, which came out to cosine of an inverse law, and 5079, which is a double cosine and an in, also an inverse law. These can be reworked into their point charge forms like this, and I like this one because this, this looks like F equals MA. It's really simple. Uh, this one is a little bit more convoluted, but it, it, gets, it gets the job done. But the problem we're running into here is if you notice, um, if you're familiar with the Bats of Art Law, Bats of Art Law is a tangent function, not a longitudinal, I'm sorry, a, tan, a transverse function, not a longitudinal function. This shows that self-inductance is long, either longitudinal from the, uh, this double arrow means accelerating charge, is longitudinal from an accelerating charge, or it's spherical. And I like the spherical. Spherical is simple. Okay, but, you know, we being scientists, we can't pick and choose what's beautiful or what's not beautiful. All right, so... Um, so which is it? The two results produce identical solutions to any self-inductance problem I tried, and I tried for a long time to figure out, tried different experiments to separate. I couldn't get any one to be any better than the other for any different uh, solution. But then we go back to the rule of acquisition 11, and we realize there can be more than one model. And rule of acquisition number 16 says that math is a superset of nature. So we should expect more than one model to fit the experimental results. And the basis for the rule of acquisition uh, 13, the proof scientific method, we have to find a different application, not just a self-inductance application, to resolve which model is more general. So what was the solution? Well, the solution is mutual inductance. Okay, since whatever model I come up for inductance must also work with mutual inductance, um, then we should search, do the same search through mutual inductance data. But since Faraday's law comes, is, works very well for mutual inductance, I developed the data from Faraday's law instead of running experiments. And what was the result? Well, and I'm going to bring, the result was the spherical model came back out, but now, this time, for the mutual inductance, we got a transverse model. And this is the bayat savart law, the B field of classical theory. Okay, so it's obvious that from the two models, the one that satisfied both was the spherical field model. Yay! This is F equals MA with a minus sign, and we went over that before. So electromagnetism has got Newton's laws, and I'll show you later, it's got all of Einstein's predictions built into. The interesting thing I learned later, that if I take the transverse model and the longitudinal model and vectorially add those two models, I come back to the spherical model. Ha, ha, ha. Coup d'etat. So what do we have? So the new electromagnetism, V1, V2, we have Coulomb's law intact. We keep F equals QV cross B intact. And we include now the new induction model for the second order effects. Okay. 
But here's the problem. If you notice now that this is a magnetic field and this is a magnetic field, but they're not the same magnetic field. What's going on here? So if everything's spherical, um, I rationalize that this must also be spherical. And how do we reconcile this to be a spherical field? Well, there's two ways. Uh, there's two very different ways to do that. I did that in new 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 magnetism document, where I, I basically complete the mass model for a hypothetical massless system uh, to derive mass that would be consistent no matter which way the object translates. Uh, but that's you know that's a little bit more controversial. The easier way was to rederive it from f equals q v cross b by including some experiments that are not included in f equals q v cross b, and that was a, a lot simpler way to get to the correct spherical field model. And so this is new electromagnetism V3 and V4 as it stands today, but these are still incomplete. Um, V4 is only different from V3 in that there are uh, uh, energy definitions of how to determine because we realize that these are kinetic energy and this is potential energy. Okay, so we need to redefine, our, we can't just use the way the heavy side, in, in, in electromagnetic theory now, energy is energy, watts or watts. There's no distinction between what's kinetic energy and what's potential energy. And in V4, that's the only difference between V3 and V4 is how we define energy uh, between these items. But we're still not done. Okay, we showed, we still do not have a light propagation model at this time. Okay, and I showed you that Maxwell was completely wrong in videos two and three. Um, and in video number four, we theorized that a medium must exist. It has to exist. Okay, um, and so we're gonna, we have to continue on and find a newer model of the ether that satisfies all of the criticisms that the old ether had. Um, we're going to look at the old ether in video 19, and we're going to begin the derivation of the new ether model in video number 21. Uh, sorry, 20. It's actually 20, 21, and 22. Okay, and there's still something missing. Okay, so the V5 models, which include or include gravity too, describe all the states, uh, all, okay, all the field effects are states of a medium that we're going to call the ether. It's different from the ether of antiquity. And again, uh, this is 2021 20, and 22 here. Okay, the light propagation has to include both transverse and longitudinal components. Um, and we have to give, uh, produce an improved wave model that replaces the Helmholtz uh, because you cannot have la transverse propagation without longitudinal propagation. We're going to show you the logic on that one. We also need an improved understanding of energy. There's a lot more energy in the universe than we take credit for and it's right under our nose and we're going to show you that in video 21. And we also have to improve mathematics. There's a gaping hole in mathematics before we can get to V5. And we have to uh, we have to produce a, a paper on that uh, prior to releasing V5. So what's next? Uh, video 19, we're going to have the, the history lesson of the luminiferous ether and the Michelson-Morley experiment. Number 20, we're going to derive the new ether model by showing you how to do reciprocal thinking. Uh, 21 is going to be the most important 15 minutes in the history of science, in my opinion. Uh, we're going to complete the new ether model. Well, they're not complete it. We're going to, the, the, the items we need to start talking about the universe, galaxies, and stars, we need another item here first. We're not going to get to the electromagnetic effects of ether until after the new mathematical construct is released because I can't go into V5 without the new mathematical construct. Anyway, then we're going to start talking about Distinti's universe. You can read those. I'm not going to read them for you. Thank you very much.